cameras ready. You have a mic? Have a mic? <laughs> How's this wire? Check, check. We have speed, cameras rolling, and take camera one. I didn't come as a comic book fan, so to me, I needed to, and I couldn't rely, I couldn't, I didn't want the audience to rely on full knowledge of the source material. They had to believe in the world and, and take it seriously. And the X-Men have always been kind of based in the real world environment, so, so that's why it, we were able to open the film in a concentration camp and, and take it quite seriously. And some really good scenes to act. I mean, it wasn't all action. It was the, the, a lot of just sitting down, talking it. Yeah, I've always, like. always sold it as a, this is not an action movie, this is a, mm. uh, a movie with action in it, Yeah, I guess you'd say. And drama yeah. actors. And great actors. And ideas, uh, you know, uh, points of view about the world, about the world historically and about the future too. Yeah, is that what attracted you guys, the new guys, to the, to the X-Men universe? Did you see that first movie? <laughs> Did you see those movies? What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> there were X-Men movies before first class. I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon? <laughs> we walked right into that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean... No. Yes, didn't, no. Yes, no is always a good thing because it keeps both sides uh, comfortable. No, uh, I was I was a fan of the the concept of you know outsiders and um, people that feel like they don't fit in, belong. Uh, that is sort of because like you, Brian, I, I never was a fan of comic books as a kid. I never read any X Men and um, didn't know much about it until the films. And that was the one thing that I always always drew me to the films was that idea of uh, an outsider, you know, somebody who's not accepted. And I think, you know, through various parts of anybody's life, most people experience that at some point. And I think that's why the series is so um, popular all over the world, because that's a universal sort of feeling. And then again, something that we were discussing earlier, uh, the civil rights element to it, and, you know, two sort of opposing ideas, uh, looking for the same thing, but different methods. Well, I, I know one, one of the first things you ever said to me, Brian, about was that uh, there were, it was relevant to being gay as a young person, that a young person might consider himself to be a mutant or be con treated as a mutant by the rest of society. And isn't it true that the demographic for the readership of the comics is young blacks, young Jews and young gays? Mm -hmm. Well, comic books in general, I think. Uh, I, know. Right? I, I always felt I, the, the gay allegory. I always felt was very strong because in some mi minorities uh, gr grow up in um, in uh, you know at least in a, in a in a family of their minority or in a community. Um, you know, a gay kid wakes up you know in adolescence and starts to realize they're different from the parents, from the brothers and sisters, from the neighborhood, and, and that can become even you know uh, more isolating. So that's I kind of when I first discussed with you and you were such an activist, uh, I, I, that was my angle. Mm. McKellen in. Yeah, Stuart? Yeah, no, right. <laughs> Different angle. You, you Hallie? Totally so. Hallie, I went, I, I went with the civil rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that so, what you got? I can Hallie? relate. Did you get that? That's me? why I got the part. First time in my life, I got a part because I was black. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was did right. you know that uh, Magneto was gay? Has, has he told you that? No, that he was Irish is what he told <laughs> me. <laughs> 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 now, I remember I'd seen Hallie in Bullworth and she was fantastic in that movie and uh, and then came in so that was that was a no-brainer and uh, so and uh, the only issue there was the wig and I think oh my god that I couldn't it was the issue even now it's <laughs> that wig is still the issue I know I remember in the hotel room you were you were finally because I'm, I'm you know in, I, I'm not good with things like wigs and you don't wear wigs? Who knew? Don't what? lie to me. I saw you the other night. Yeah, we saw you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't know, but the, <laughs> but I, re I remember, yeah, this, that, and, it, and from movie to movie, it's still, it's still an issue. Still because, an issue. But wigs but it's, and, and it's an issue with the fans, too. I mean, they take personal ownership over Storm's hair and how it should be and how it shouldn't be, and... It, it's an issue. Which well, means yeah. Peter's, Peter's hairdo in this. <laughs> oh, Everybody man. thought Peter was Speaking wearing of wigs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait till you see the 70s wig that I wear. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. No, it is no wig on Peter. No. It is his real startling Just hair. He reminds me. What was the driver? The driver was on the way to... Is it hot? He was like, it's why, why is he Irish suddenly? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me if it was hot, and I said, what? What? The wig. Is it hot? Yeah, it is very hot. <laughs> if you mean sexy, yes, <laughs> it is hot. You, you're talking about the fans. Like, how aware are any of you of the fan 
talk back and what they do and don't like from the movies as we make them as we move forward like where do you get the access oh, of really the fans aware. being yeah. and they come up to me and tell me all the time you know even our first movie is what now 13 years ago they still come up to me and they have comments about the wig the ex suits one of their biggest concerns has always been why does storm get no love <laughs> how come nobody wants to love Storm? How come no guy is attracted to Storm? I said, I don't know. I'm asexual. Don't, don't, don't you know? Mm -hmm. And the fans really can't understand why Storm <laughs> gets no <She's> love. She's <laughs> tempestuous. <laughs> <laughs> and I never have an answer for that. So, you know, I'm always trying to recreate, you know, come up with some answer that will satisfy them in the moment. Other guys, fans? Any, any reasons huh? why? Fans? You, 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 <laughs> Am I a fan? No, I was, like, I was a fan of the cartoon <laughs> when I was a kid. And, um, but and again, I never read the comic books. But I think what's quite interesting about the whole series of films that are related to each other, okay. um, no problem. No, but it's true, it's good, it's good. Um, is that, you know, like the comic books, actually, like the people that they portray, but like the comic books, they constantly evolve. There's different runs, they're all different, they're all... And I think that's what I responded to with with getting, you know, the approach to go and do first class was that it represented an evolution. And what's really interested about, interesting about this movie is that it, it carries on with that evolution at the same time as trying to hold on to what it has always been as well. So it's, it's, it's like a kind of Darwinian picture, do you know what I mean, for X-Men. It's quite, it's quite interesting. And that's what I like about X-Men, because if you are going to have, you know, including the Wolverine pictures, seven movies, they can't just stay the same. And they have, I think, moved. And that's a difficult thing I've found with um, fans is that some fans want you just to stay the same. They don't want you to change, they don't want you, and then other, but then how are you gonna make new fans? And how are you gonna, and not all fans are like that. Some fans want it to evolve, you know? But, um, but some people like that one run of that comic book and some people like that one movie of that group of films that are related to each other. In France, it, uh, Omar, it was X-Men. What's, what's X-Men in France? What is the... Uh... X-Om. What? X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-X-
We have not yet I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I may have moved on a little. So. He's got to share his life with someone else eventually. Uh, we, had, uh, we had one half day, I think, uh, on the set. And uh, it was uh, memorable for a variety of reasons. For you. <laughs> You've already forgotten it. I, I, I don't know your bloody name. Um, <laughs> no, it was good, eh? It was quite, it was really interesting and really, was, I don't know, it was, I never thought for a minute when I took on Charles that I'd ever be acting with you playing Charles. So it was, it was kind of brilliant. And I've been a fan of yours for years, so that was a bit of a thrill too. They're both being self-deprecating. So I'm going to say, really fucking yeah. humble here. being so on swear. set, uh, watching these guys, and I remember, and I commented it to Patrick, it was James's first day on set. It was a really pivotal s scene, and literally walked straight on into a, this incredibly, I think, will become iconic moment, which I think you beautifully directed. It was so great to watch the two of them. Um, I fell asleep at one point, but apart from that, <laughs> <laughs> it was a good two or three hours into it. <laughs> and I was on this anyway. You, know, you were lying down anyway, dude. Yeah. It's cool. And Michael, talk about a little bit, you know, you're because we're arcing from first class to this movie to imagining you would eventually become Ian in your... How do you sort of fashion the performance with him in mind, but, you know? Well, I've just been watching a lot of YouTube footage and, uh, and just trying to sort of, you know, um, yeah, make that sort of um, connection. Because, again, like, in first class, it was supposed to be sort of a, a brand-new sort of shake-up. So there was a point in time where I, you know, I was talking to Matthew at the time. I was like, well, should I go away and study Ian's accent? And Matthew was like, no, I want you to stick with your accent. So that's going to be a bit of a weird thing in this one. I will be speaking differently. <laughs> um, but uh, so on this one, because we were both in the same film and that opportunity came about, I did what I was sort of thinking of doing in the first one. So I studied a lot of um, Ian's RSC workshop. <laughs> tape from what year was th is that? Was that 1979? Some no. <laughs> 79? Something like that? Anyway, yeah. so um, I've been listening to that probably thousands of times and, uh, yeah. and just sort of working away on that. And then um, it's always kind of weird doing the metal manipulation. So I studied a little bit of that as well. Um, yeah, see, not bad. Oh, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, they're not very oh, similar. Wow. Oh. oh, it's a match. Oh, yeah, that's good. creepy, isn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, so you ne you don't you yeah, you no never got to sail um, um, the Golden Gate Bridge over to Alcatraz, did you? No, that's ridiculous. He does something similar. Yeah, we've done something similar. Oh, have you? One, yeah. Oh, yeah. what? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe even bigger, Ian, I'm just yeah. saying. Oh, <laughs> like, I didn't maybe. Know. You can what? say it, yeah. <laughs> and how do you keep it straight here? You got everybody. You're both sides of the coin, you're both periods, you've been in every movie. Very greedy, <laughs> very greedy. It's actually, it's been an unbelievable opportunity because, I mean, if you think how when Brian first took on X-Men 1, comic book movies were really not, forget about In Vogue, they really weren't on the table at all. And now you have an unbelievable cast, uh, some who are not even with us today, and I get the opportunity to work with every one of them. I feel unbelievably grateful literally every day. And the way... I hope I'm not giving away too much, but we, because... we control this, so... Oh, I love it. So <laughs> Ian, and, Ian and Patrick, uh, I think it was mainly your schedule where they were doing a play, so we shot the future part first. So it was literally like a reunion to begin with. There was, you know, Brian and all of us together, and uh, obviously Howley and, and Ellen and Sean and, uh, and uh, Anna Paquin, and it was unbelievable uh, to be on set and do that for, I don't want to say how long, but... And then we sort of flipped and went into the past, um, where in a way, you and me, Brian, were walking in in the atmosphere that you guys have created, because the movie's really a sequel to your movie. So it was an, it's been an incredible embarrassment of riches. It's like doing two great movies in one. It's also fun um, because um, I chose to bring in the, the hallways uh, and the and Cerebro from the original uh, yeah. X-Men films because John Meyer and I always uh, were inclined to, f uh, the production designer always were inclined to believe that those were built like futurism of the, of the 60s and 70s, um, kind of like uh, 2001. So, so to have those sets now built again for the th whatever, third or fourth time, and then to have the younger actors who are in first class who've been in an X-Men movie played 
famous X-Men characters, but have never been in those particular sets. Mm -hmm. It was very fun, and they happened to be doing their costume fittings. Uh, Nick, Jan, and, and and all you guys, were, or some of you guys, were, and walk. It was fun to watch them walk on those sets and feel like, oh, it's like if I walked on like the Millennium Falcon or some some kind of familiar set, and then seeing you standing there in full Wolverine is also mm -hmm. in that environment is also, I don't. It was fun to watch the you know those guys more, ease into it. More fun than the first time I walked on that set because I remember one of the crew members says, oh, Elvis is in the building, and you overheard it because my hair was like, Ooh. <laughs> And we shut down filming and yeah. it was, we went back to the makeup trailer oh, for God. about five hours. Who was it that said that? <laughs> it was this guy who did not work on the film for long. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first. I, I've, I've done a film that took place in the 80s, the 40s, and a film, Second World War. I've, this is a period of time that I was a child in. Um, probably when I was watching and consuming this kind of science fiction fantasy material and, and, and yet uh, making a film, the design, the clothing is such a weird mind, uh, seeing the, how awful the yeah. collars were and the yeah. pants and the fitting. I mean, you guys make them look very good. <laughs> the 70s is a good time for you, fashion. You, you hate it. it. I think it's ridiculous. I love it. I love it. The 70s has been good to me. I was born then. <laughs> the cars in, are great. The cars are in oh, oh, man, yeah. we've some good cars. 50s? 50s for me right. for cars. Yeah, okay. Most beautiful yeah. designs. Just embrace it, man. In the 70s You're in the 70s. I'm, I'm loving it. Embrace you know, it. I'm going, on all, I'm going Ron Burgundy in the whole thing. <laughs> going back to what you were saying earlier about the Cerebro corridors, I freaked out completely because it was walking along in there, and obviously I watched the original films. When I was like 10 or whatever. Shut up. And then, uh, <laughs> very young. Yeah. 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 And then looking Thank over, you. it was because <clears throat> like when we did the first class, it didn't really feel, even though it was an X-Men movie, it didn't really feel related. So walking in those corridors and looking over at you, I was like, I completely freaked out. <laughs> and was so nervous until your wheelchair went really slowly for that one take. We were, all <laughs> we were walking along so slowly. <laughs> the, the guys had to walk behind my wheelchair. And yeah, and for some reason it was it had been turned the speed on it had been turned down. And so we did this take and we, we have to travel like twenty meters or something yeah. like that. And my, my chair is literally going like this <laughs> fast. And it just took us like what a minute and a half to walk yeah. it and we're all like just the guys are walking behind me with this going. Yeah. Nobody's like, just <laughs> made the dialogue last for the move. That's right. That's funny. One of the things that's cool about the movies is just how the villains are always really real and grounded. And we have a new villain in this movie. You want to talk a little bit about trust? I played the villain? Mm, not from your perspective. No, everyone believes they're right. All our villains believe they're, they're, they're right. And they're all justified. Mo justified, that's it, yeah. And they're justified sociopolitically. Again, not necessarily personally. There's no personal vendettas or, or, or mm -hmm. revenge stories. Um, there was a bit in X-Men 2 with Stryker because of his son. But in this, is, this Trask is more of a Actually, he's a peace lover, oddly enough. Yeah, yeah, he's, he has good intentions. Um, he doesn't have a flamboyant villain costume or anything like Just that. Just hair. He has great hair and a pair of eyeglasses and his microscope. But he really truly does. It's really grounded in reality, and he really does think he's doing the world a service. Um, you know, he likes his economic freedoms, but uh, no, he really sees them as a threat. Yeah, yeah, there's a line in the movie. I, I, at first I thought, oh, mutants, are they really that bad? And it's your scene in the White House where you basically explain to, the, to President Nixon right. that, you know, it, one I can would... control metal, well, that's right. your army, and the other can be anyone, even you. Right. Which means they can launch a nuclear strike if they want to, and, that, and that's just two of them. And mm -hmm. suddenly I was like, wow, you'd, you'd need to start revolutionizing your army and changing your tactics if you did fear a group like that. It is the classic thing where the mutants are just sort of evolving faster. Human beings are kind of like the Neanderthal and they will be overtaken. I mean, that's just sort of the laws of sort of evolution, isn't it? So. Yeah, no, that's also, just... What you said as well about like quite often the baddies in X-Men being grounded in reality. If X-Men and mutants in this world represent, like we've been talking about, the ghettoized, the disenfranchised, the people who are um, on the outside looking in. Generally, your, your biggest enemy, or certainly the person you're probably most afraid of, is, is Joe Normal, do you know what I mean? Because that's the person that's got a problem with you. The normal guy, that's, that's your bad guy, you know? So it's quite interesting that like, he is so grounded in reality and mm -hmm. truth. Brian, was there ever a moment for you of 
well, there must be some nerves with every movie, but having done one and two, taking a break, was this an easy decision or were you always like, oh? Well, it was an easy decision to make because uh, I had produced and, got, and, and wrote the story for First Class. Um, so I was in, already involved in that movie. And the opportunity to get to work with that amazing cast as a director now and get back with you guys who are just awesome to work with and had so much fun with it, it's, uh, um, that made it an easy decision. The, the actual, the story was scary. The, the, initially, we, had, we didn't have the, the time travel figured out, how it would work, who, 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 like, like just how it would work. Because yeah. there's a lot of laws that you have to create and then adhere to when you're yeah. making those kind of movies. So it was only the moment when I felt that I had figured that out that I felt confident to move forward and now explore the story that, that, that Simon had been developing uh, with Matthew and that, um, and that we were continuing to develop together. You know, it's funny, the, the title, the, it, it feels like we're living days of future past in right. our own reality. Like, there's certain things that have happened in the past and now we're, I get to go back in time with all these folks and, and mix it up a bit, change it. Yeah, it's, it, when we were working on the script, one of the things that was tough for people was the way it bounced from future to past, and they couldn't track it. So I just started putting in the slug lines, as you all know, or the ones of you that read the script, um, <laughs> that, that it says future and past in the slug lines. So it literally is bouncing back and forth the whole movie. And, and the biggest thing we did from the comic book to this film, I think that the biggest change was in the original story, Kitty Pride goes back in time. Um, and in this, she's sending Logan back. Um, so I don't know if you read the comic or the script first. Oh, um, I, I read the script, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think this was a great way of figuring out how to meld the two together. And, um, and I just like love the whole aesthetic of the future and the difference from the last one and the sort of like DIY survival. Um, it, was, it was awesome. There were moments for me that were cool in the future too because and it was the first day of shooting, and you're saying, when people are gonna see the fact that Bobby and Magneto were walking down this hallway, like, what does that mean? What does that, how does that expand the world? I mean, these two characters that never would have interacted in the past are all of a sudden interacting, and to what end? And I think that's kind of a fun, uh, a fun avenue that was opened up, because all of a sudden, these people that were enemies in the past have found that common goal, and I think that's just a fun thing to explore with all these characters, and just as an actor, it's like, Ian, you and I were in scenes before, but we never really spent yeah. much time together, and so that was kind of a nice surprise to, to get to do that. So that was kind of fun for me. I it, it, it's mature as well. That's the mature thing about the, the comic books and the series. That's what happens, like, in times of war, political, you know, leaders that are total sort of opposite ends, they do get together. They have to get together sometimes and work things out and sort of even work together. So I've always found that really interesting with the relationship between Professor X and Magneto, that there is, there's a complexity there um, that just goes beyond, you know, two sort of enemies. They're friends as well as being enemies. That's great. There's so much to play with there. And you guys get to do both things in this movie. I mean, yeah. when, you, when you come back together, you're sort of enemies, you unite and then split back apart. Yeah, it's almost like they both realize they're both necessary. Mm. You know, they're, you know, both sides of the coin. Yeah, I think, James, you said that at one point, that like there couldn't be a Professor Xavier without a Magneto in his life, that there is part of the evolution was having to go through the... Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, I think the way I've always viewed Professor X is as a voyeur, not Professor X, but Charles, as I've had the opportunity to play him, is as a voyeur. So he's a genius and he's got this ability to read people's minds, and, but his real power is is a very human thing. His real gift is empathy, mm. you know? He can empathise with people's problems and he can help them. But as a young man, I think, you, we, well, certainly the way I tried to play him was that he was much more like a kind of like posh guy, fascinated with, with working class guy, do you know what I mean? A little bit. And he becomes very sort of drawn to that figure then. And then what happens in this movie is, is well, at the end of the last movie, you give him his angst. You give him his thing that makes him just like everybody else, actually. And therefore, he can't be a voyeur inside people's minds anymore. He's a, he's a, he's a passenger on the same train, and he's and the train is going to hell, you know. Um, and they're really, they're just, they're like that with each other. They're, they're really close. They're stuck in each other's journey, aren't they? Was the hairstyle your idea? Changing the hairstyle? No. 
I that was, that really was Brian's cool. idea. Yeah, we just wanted to again be di well. My, my feeling about the future is that you're you're you you be, you you've sort of become had to become militarized. Yeah. So I wanted storm. This is this this is the storm, the, the warrior fighter that she ultimately had to become in this alternate terrible future. But it was it my favorite version of Storm, actually. I thought she, it, it finally came together for me, who mm. she was. The hair had always been a, an issue. I mean, when you have to wear a head of gray hair, you know, that, right away, that's like <laughs> a little daunting. But I think that... Platinum. The, platinum, that's a nice way to put it. Mm. You know, it looked gray. But I think this time, because of the, the, the edginess of it and the vibe of it, it made gray a lot easier to pull off, or platinum a lot easier to <clears> pull off. Um, we're going to wrap up, I think, but I'll ask you the last thing. I was thinking about just having everybody here, that tweet you, you, you made about the Oscars and Emmys and all the different insane awards these people have won. Um, the hardest kind of acting to do is taking the, the most outlandish characters and making them believable and serious. I think, I think it is some of the hardest acting. Um, dramatic acting, is, uh, it, it, con uh, conventional drama, you know, Believability is grounded in something we all understand, but when you've got to make an audience believe in characters who can fly and who can move metal and, 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 and do all this fantastical, sometimes silly stuff, silly seeming stuff, and actually bring truth to it requires the best actors. So um, it makes sense to me that such a lauded group of uh, actors participate in this kind of movie. Um, but when we were all, when we were adding it up, it, it's like, I couldn't fit the nominations into my tweet, <laughs> but it's insane. Th that, that's when these movies are at their best. Um, and that was why it was so important early on, Ian and Patrick, in the very beginning. That was, that was the, to, to make, you know, that, that, that would legitimize this endeavor. We almost, Hugh, was la that was X-Men, one. Yeah. You were, you came in. We were, I was, was cast after you'd started filming. So yeah, almost a month of the film. Remember they said, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I came in to do a test with Brian and they said, you're going to have to wait to the end of the day because they're shooting. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. almost hoping you wouldn't work out because then I'd have, I, I'd shut down for two weeks and figure out the script. Right. And then he walked in and I was like, oh, this guy might work. I, t I told you what happened though. This one guy comes up, this, uh, that while you were doing your screen test with Anna Paquin, uh, this, this custodian at Roy Thompson Hall comes up to me and, and he doesn't know who I am, the director, because I'm standing kind of away from the monitor and he pokes me. I'm like, yeah? And he says, is that the guy that got to play Wolverine? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and the guy was like, cool. Oh, phew. Because cool. I wasn't, I had no money and I gave him 50 bucks and it was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, see that guy over there, tip him on the shoulder. He can tip on the shoulder and go, this guy's cool, he's yeah. awesome. It was memorable because we, we've been shooting yeah, you were... a, a couple of weeks or three weeks. Yeah. And, yeah. and this, yeah. this cute Australian guy turned up and we all thought he was really cute and really nice. <laughs> I remember you saying like, well, you know, you won't see me again after today. <laughs> <laughs> How was the accent then? That was pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty good, yeah. Uh, real bad. And then I think, I think before the day was over, you'd made the decision. Oh, no, I offered it to It's the only time yeah. I've ever okay, offer, right. offered a so film directly to somebody. I never thought I haven't got a job more in my life because as everyone on these couches will know, when Brian directs, he quite often is difficult to tell if he's happy or not because we, hmm, cut. <laughs> <laughs> this was my audition. All right, just do the second scene. He yeah, maybe a little, yeah, all right, cut. And I was like, oh, I haven't got this. <laughs> he gave me less enthused. And he came over and gave me a hug. He said, thanks, Wolverine, you're on the film. I said, what? It was, uh, well, I was quite surprised. Did they make you do any kind of like, and stuff? For... No, thank God. No. <laughs> no. Well, he was coming off curly in Oklahoma. That's so right. So it was sort of like, hello. You know. <laughs> in the end, it's, it's very much about Charles becoming Charles, or becoming Professor X. Or the yeah. other, you know, each, each movie has their own you know, specific journey, and, but, but in the end, I think that people are going to find at the heart of the movie, that's the, the, the story we're telling. And I, and I like that story. Professor X has always been my personal favorite character, probably because I'm a director and he's sort of the director of his, of his peer group. And, uh, and, oh, and yet it's lonely at the top. Jeez. Yes. Lonely in the room. Oh. That's good. Yeah, it's good, guys. He's always been. Know. He's always been. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Can you tell me? Let's go. What? We'll leave you with Charles. Yeah, yeah. What did I say?
Thank you, guys.